products that add a characterizing flavor. So these are things like mentholated cigarettes, hookah tobacco, which is generally flavored with molasses or honey and then added flavor. And then also any flavored vaping solution, these could be pre-filled, they could also be, um, you know, like pod based products, they could be the, the bottles like what you see on this picture, but these are typically nicotine solutions that have added flavors in them. There's also a ton of smokeless tobacco products out there. We also know that there are also these new tobacco leaf free. Um, there are also synthetic nicotine smokeless tobacco products, flavored little cigars and cigarillos. Um, flavored cigar wrappers, and then also other product enhancers that we're starting to see pop up on the market as a way to go around flavored ordinances. So what you can probably figure out from the industry is that they are doing everything they can to try to make sure that flavored products remain on the market. So there are a lot of flavored products out there. Um, I also just want to note when it comes to mentholated cigarettes that menthol is actually in most cigarettes. And the reason for that is because it numbs the throat and makes it easier for people to smoke and to use these products. But when we have menthol cigarettes like Cool or Newport, that they have added additional menthol and so it's a characterizing flavor. So that's really important when we start looking at policy language. Um, fortunately, we have a bunch of public health lawyers that do all that stuff for us. So the reason that we talk about why we want to ban the sale of flavored tobacco is because we know that the majority of young people, including young people in California, who start to use a commercial tobacco product, start with a flavored device. So either a vaping device or sm like smokeless tobacco, hookah tobacco, which we are seeing more young people using, and then other flavored products like mentholated cigarettes. And we also know that policies that ban the sale of flavored tobacco, it's a strategy for preventing young people from using. So our team does um, a lot of focus groups with young people and ask questions about why youth start using these different commercial tobacco products. And one of the reasons that we hear is that they taste good, and this idea of tasting good makes you know it seem can, like they're not can, as harmful. Okay, oh, we can work on my um, We also know when it comes to mentholated products that almost nine out of 10 or 90% of the African-American black community who start using a cigarette start with a mentholated product. And this is, this is not by fault. This is by design of the tobacco industry. So um, again, a whole other presentation that we can do at another time, but what the industry does, is they strategically place advertising and marketing in black communities that are focused on mentholated cigarettes. They um, have advertising and marketing that features African-American and black models. They make the products cheaper in the black community. Um, they've even in the past used the imagery and the culture of the black community to sell their products. And what they're doing is they are selling death and disease. So if we can stop the sale of these products, if we can get rid of these products from the market, we could save so many lives of our African-American and black community members and also prevent death and disease. And so that's the, the big question is, why is this product still legal? Why are flavored tobacco products still legal if we know that it's the number one reason that youth and young adults start using products? Why do we still sell mentholated products if we know that they are killing thousands and thousands of people within the black community? And the reason for that is because the tobacco industry is super powerful, right? So um, in 19, or in, sorry, in 2009, President Obama signed a law that banned the sale of all flavored cigarettes except for mentholated cigarettes. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is the tobacco industry, again, has a very powerful lobby. And so back in 2009, one of the largest US-based companies now called Altria, also Philip Morris, um, they actually lobbied in favor of our FDA bill, which is what President Obama signed in 2009, because at that time they were not selling flavored cigarettes other than mentholated products. Some of the other cigarette companies were selling flavored products, but not Philip Morris. And so there was a big lobby and a big push to ban only the sale of flavored cigarettes 
and not to include menthol. Um, the other reason is that back in 2009, when this, this law was signed, we did not have these vaping devices um, and we did not have the higher rates of some of these other products like little cigars and cigarillos and smokeless and hookah. Uh, they just weren't used as commonly as they are now. And a lot of that is because people are switching from combustible cigarettes over to these other products that are flavored. They're not regulated the same way. They taste better and so they seem less harmful. And in many cases, they're a lot cheaper. And so since that time, the industry has been advocating and lobbying to keep the sale of flavored products, specifically mentholated products in communities. So President Obama actually in that law that he signed in 2009, put together a group of scientists and community leaders to make a recommendation on whether or not the sale of menthol should continue. And that body said many, many years ago, no, we need to ban mentholated products. And yet the lobby, the tobacco industry is very much um, active in all of our communities and trying to prevent this work. And they have been in doing so for the most part. However, I think it's really important to note that the work that you all are doing at the local level, the work that is really grassroots is powerful. It is powerful, it's more powerful than this industry that we are slowly taking down. And so the industry is constantly changing their tactics because the more work we do at the local level, then that work starts to go up and we start to see changes at an even larger level. And so back in 2010 to 2017, within a seven year time frame, there were only 17 jurisdictions or cities, counties in California that passed an ordinance or a law that banned the sale of flavored commercial tobacco products. And just three years later, last year in 2020, there were 103 communities that had these strong policies. And the community I'm in, the city of Sacramento was one of those jurisdictions that did this awesome work. And so what we know is all of this local work that you all have been doing at the local level, that your peers have been doing across California, that that has led to statewide legislation. And in August of 2020, Governor Newsom signed a bill, it's called SB 793, you may have heard of it. And he quickly signed that into law, which made it illegal to sell most flavored tobacco products in California. And that um, covered mentholated cigarettes, it covered flavored vaping devices, pre-filled or those standalone bottles, flavored smokeless, little cigars and cigarillos, and even cigar wrappers, and then other flavored product enhancers. So it closed the gap on a lot of these things. It unfortunately though did not cover hookah tobacco, which the, the industry has really lobbied to keep. And then some other products like large cigars that cost $12 or more, and then some loose leaf tobacco. So that was such a huge win for public health in California. But right after Governor Newsom signed that legislation, the industry stepped in and they introduced a referendum, which is like a ballot initiative that they are they tried to and were successful in getting onto our next ballot. And so the industry wanted to put a stop. And so instead of um, allowing this to go forward, they got signatures they had to um, collect over 600,000 signatures of California voters to be able to put a pause on SB 793 from being implemented. And then um, if, it got, if they got those signatures, then it would go on to the next ballot. Unfortunately, they were successful in getting this initiative passed through um, voters. And so it will go on to our next ballot, not the upcoming ballot for the governor recall, but in um, November, 2022. And so what that means is that the implementation of SB 793 is paused until it goes to the voters. And then voters will decide, do we want to move forward with what the legislature did or do we want to um, overturn it and continue to do what we do now, which is allow the sale of flavored tobacco at the state level unless local work is done. We also know that the work happening locally, the work that happened in 
uh, in California at the state level, but that led to federal action. And so just recently, the US Food and Drug Administration said that they plan on banning the sale of mentholated cigarettes and flavored cigars, which is a huge win again for public health. However, this could take a while. They, they're saying it could take up for a year for the federal government to be able to do this. And we know that the industry will do all they can to stop this from happening, which is why we are where we are today. And so what we have to do is we just have to continue to disrupt the industry. And so we do that by advocating locally, which is what you all are here this week to do, is to talk about how do we do that, to learn how to do that, and how to make sure that decision makers in your local communities are hearing you, are listening to you, and are protecting you and your peers and other community members from these products. So one of the best things we can do is to continue to educate our communities and to continue to educate your decision makers on what is flavored tobacco, what are all of these different products, why are they so problematic, and why is it so critical that we get them out of our community. And so one way that we do this, as I mentioned earlier, is we do this through tobacco retail licenses. It's not the only way that can be done. It's just one of the more effective ways that it can be done. And this is where we require every store that sells tobacco to have a license. So there is that requirement at the state level. Um, however, we can make them stronger at the local level so that if somebody wants to sell tobacco, if they're a grocery store, if they're a corner store, a liquor store, or even a tobacco store, they have to have a special license to be able to sell the product. And with that, um, one of the things that you can do at the local level is you can have an annual fee that they have to pay and you can increase the fee so that you can use the funds from the fee for the license to cover the cost of enforcement. Now, one of the things that we talk about when we, we look at enforcement in our field is it's really critical that we enforce the retailers who are selling the product and we're not doing enforcement with the people who are using. Because again, this is a public health issue. This is a product that is highly addictive. Um, and the industry is making it their business to sell this product. So we need to stop the industry and we need to stop from selling the products, which tobacco retail licenses do. And for anybody that's caught selling a commercial tobacco product to someone under the age of 21 in California, they could be fined or their license can be removed and they would no longer be able to sell the product. So again, this is one method or one vehicle of being able to include a flavor ban. But with TRLs, it's not the only thing. Um, there's other things that we can do within TRLs. We can decrease the number of stores in our community. You might hear that as density. You can prevent stores from being near schools or park or other areas where young people are at. Um, there's also things we can do with trying to um, limit the, how much tobacco is sold in terms of pack sizes or costs or all sorts of different things. So again, we're really fortunate that we have awesome public health attorneys that can work with us on all this legal language, that we don't have to worry about that part. We get to do the fun part of educating our communities, educating decision makers, and ask them to protect our communities from these products. So with that, um, I do want to note that we're now in break. Uh, we just went a minute over. So we have a break until 4.05, but I'm going to go ahead and just uh, leave this room open. If anybody has any questions, you can chat, you can unmute yourself. I'm also going to drop my email in here. I recognize we didn't have much time to share all this, but if you have any questions, let me know, or you can message me throughout the conference. I'm happy to answer everything. If not, um, you can take your break and then at 4.04.10, oh, look, I'm actually a little bit fast. I'm ahead of time. So we do have a couple of minutes for question. Um, but you also, if you don't have any questions and you want to hop back, you'll have a break until 4.10. And then you can jump back into the next um, activity at 4.10 using your Whova app. And all of the sessions are here. So with that, I will open it up for questions. Anyone have any? Okay, well then I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick around in this room if you do have a question. If not, then go ahead, you get an extra two minutes for break. I kind of rushed through thinking I was running late.
sorry for, for talking so fast, everybody, but um, take your break, stick around if you do wanna talk about anything. Otherwise, um, under this panel, there's also some resources you can use if your group at the conference is planning on working on a flavor ban or a TRL as part of the activity. There's some talking points, there's some resources, and then also the slides that I just shared with all of the information about federal and state law, um, you can uh, pull those for your activity. So we do have a question, how do they make the flavors in vapes? That's a great question. So vaping devices have a number of different components to them. Um, typically the nicotine, which is the addictive component of it, then they have propylene glycol or um, another, another substance that helps the, the solution become a vapor or aerosol. And then they add other flavors. So the flavors can be a natural solution, natural oils, or it can be chemicals that they use um, in labs. So one example, and this is something that we heard a lot about in the past couple of years is um, companies use some uh, different chemicals that they put on like popcorn or use in toffee to make it taste like butter. And it's just a chemical that they, they create in a lab and then it's an additive. So it's a food safe chemical. And so they've been putting those things into uh, these flavorings into vaping devices. The trick with it, with the, the food safe chemicals is that even if the FDA has approved these food safe chemicals for use in food, like in popcorn or candy, think about like strawberry flavored Starburst or something like that. Um, those are not approved for inhalation. So they've been tested and approved for you to eat them and for your body, your stomach to break that down, but they haven't been studied and tested and approved for heating it and inhaling it. So that's where it becomes problematic. And that's where we heard a lot about popcorn lung and vaping because those chemicals that taste like butter that they add to microwave popcorn, um, what they found is in research that people who work at plants that produce microwave popcorn actually were getting popcorn lung from the insulation of that chemical. And now it's in a number of vaping devices. Um, a few years ago, researchers at UC San Diego found that there's over 15,000 unique flavors of vape juices on the market. And that was a few years ago. So I'm imagining it's probably quite a bit more. Are there any other questions? If not, feel free to jump off, go grab some water or a snack before you join the next session at 410.